but you know what? Let's focus on some other solutions and exploring some other solutions and talk about some really cool things in this industry because there are many. I mean, um, the excitement and energy in this retail sector is, is still unparalleled. Some of the trends that we've seen through the survey, integrated wireless electronics, uh, machine to machine, we know that that's coming. We've heard it. The carriers have been singing that tune for quite some time. Uh, the mobile payment space, how will that affect you as retailers? Uh, is it a technology that's going to be adopted? Is it something that will benefit you in the store environment? The tablet evolution, we know they're here to stay. We know that it's, it uh, potentially could be a good revenue product line for you guys. And um, an increased emergence of, of prepaid plans. Um, the challenges we've seen that are pretty common, number one, attracting, retaining quality staff. You know, we heard uh, Bill Strickland earlier this morning, his keynote reference staff as assets, and, and IQmetrics truly believes that. And um, obviously that remains the number one challenge in this type of economy and, and in your environment. Uh, shrinking margins, obviously, we saw the, the numbers on the graphs I just presented. They don't lie. You know, we, know, we all know it. We're all experiencing it. We're all living it. So when we look at this slide, and for those of you who can't, can't make it out, this bottom part is feature phones. The orange part is Android. The brown is iOS. And then way up there in the blue is BlackBerry and Microsoft. Um, and any others are the other at the very top. So you'll see a September, a little bit of a September bump for total Apple sales, um, a huge bump this month. But um, have you ever seen an iPhone launch with, with this negative press around it? Well, there's a little bit of backlash against iPhone right now. If you look at Android, there's a, Android, there's a surge in Android. And why is that? Well, if you think about Android from a developer standpoint, They've been really torn between do we build Android apps, iPhone apps, both. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an investment, and it's a big investment in the direction you take. Android's an open platform, so it's real easy to develop for it, low cost, but it doesn't monetize as well as iPhone and iTunes, through iTunes. But you still see Android growing, so the apps are there, You've got a diversity in manufacturers. So when you think about almost every manufacturer is making, except Apple and RIM are making Androids. You've got a variety of price points. You've got a growth in their store. You've got an overall acceptance of Android. It's, it's not a new thing now, it's established. And I think what you're gonna see is you're gonna, you're gonna see that spike in share for iOS in the next month or two, and you're gonna see it level back down pretty fast. But feature phones didn't die. So it is kind of a surprising story. They're still going. Why do, we think that, why do you think that is? So I'll offer up a couple of ideas. One is, the biggest one, is I don't wanna get a data plan. I don't wanna spend that extra money. And it's gonna take some moves by the industry, primarily the carriers, to change that. So what they could do is, like what Verizon's doing, is trying to create bundles on voice and data. I think we'll see more bundling. I think we'll see greater segmentation of the data plans. So whether they put caps on the amount of usage or they throttle the speeds. But between those two things, you got to turn this machine back on and get more smartphone sales. You can't let this feature phone thing run. I think our, the industry took their eye off it, and there's a lot of people just saying we're staying on the sidelines. Now, for you guys, every feature phone subscriber you sign up is a potential smartphone upgrade. So you never want to throw away their names. They're, <laughs> they're going to get a smartphone eventually. I think that you'll see this trend reverse this year. Apple has traditionally had the lowest return rate of any of the OEMs. So they've been very consistent. I would say there's, there's quality there. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't take away from the quality of the product. But I would also say you've got this loyal, there's like a you know, loyalty devotion to the product. They're not, seldom are they gonna bring back their iPhone 
and get the LG Lucid or the HTC One X. They'll, they, they've really wanted that Apple, and they don't return it very often. What HTML5 will do is, you know, to a certain degree, level the playing field. Um, and it will allow, given the fact that Apple, Microsoft, and Google are all adopting HTML5 as a standard for mobile browsers, it'll take another two to three years to fully develop until the standard is, uh, is fully adopted and finalized. But what'll happen is app developers will be able to develop an HTML5 uh, for a certain degree of their applications and be able to have a common set of code um, or software across all of these operating systems. Average household, we're not talking about you know, high spending households, we're talking about the average household will own over 10 to 15 connected consumer electronics in their house by the year 2015. And I think that that trend is, I mean, that number's conservative. So it's gonna be blood pressure monitors, it's gonna be TVs, it's gonna be refrigerators, it's gonna be anything that you can dream of that can have a processor and a screen and a camera that we can have an application development platform on. The new form factors and new technologies will enable us to carry mobile devices in different ways that's never been possible before. And it's a real trend, it's already happening. So if you look at the heads up display that Google's talking about, yeah, we know it's expensive today, we know it's limited today, but if you fast forward five to 10 years, we're all gonna be wearing it. It's gonna be integrated into our sunglasses, it's gonna be integrated into our, uh, into our eyeglasses, possibly even our contact lenses at some point. So the power of mobile devices is coming to us in new different types of form factors. The main drivers, I think, you know, are coming from how consumers want to use these devices in the environments where they use them. So meaning, if I'm out in an environment, I'm making a purchase, I, I, I'm a consumer that's open to a mobile payment or an offer that may be sent to me right when I'm in front of McDonald's, right? Or right when I'm inside the gap. Um, so it, it's really about consumer behavior and how they, how they adapt it. What does, and we could go on, on and on forever about how, um, how the, what the drivers are, but what does it do to affect the folks in this room? I think, and this is something we've talked about a lot with some of, some of them, which is it really does affect the point of sale environment. We have to give consumers an understanding of the experience that they can have with their devices. Um, and some of the things that we've worked on in the past are how do you create environments where people understand how to use their phones, right? Maybe it's a mobile payment zone, so people understand, and maybe it's open, opening yourselves up to partnerships with some of the local vendors who are adopting mobile payments to come into your stores and say, hey, help me create an environment where people understand that they, they can use their points, their, their device at the point of sale to get a coupon and redeem that coupon right at the point of sale. I want to help consumers understand how to do that right at the point of sale. Maybe it's an environment where you partner together with a content provider that may be local like a cable company and say, hey, help me understand how to seamlessly transition content between uh, a mobile device and a tablet and a TV. And I think it's creating those types of environments where consumers can start to really realize at the point of sale um, how uh, their devices can be used in a different way over the next three to five years. And I think that's the opportunity uh, for, you know, for the retail environment to really accelerate not only the adoption, but then get yourself involved in more margin opportunities and more sale opportunities. So I think that the carriers, you know, I, and some of them talk about how they're open to developers, they're listening to the developers, but they'll only do those changes if there's money attached, if they can monetize that innovation. So I'm still, I'll put my vote, I think the carriers, you know, with their credit policies, they have so many levers they can pull and drive mobile payments based on finance. Yes, those decisions happen at point of sale, but it, I think it even goes f earlier in the cycle. And, and for the marketers in the room, you know, it puts added pressure on you guys to make sure you get the right message out to your customer base. Are they in the, I buy based on OS bucket? Am I in the, I buy based on carrier coverage? Am I now, you know, affiliated with a certain OEM? I think, I think that puts extra pressure on the marketers to make sure that message gets out right the first time to your market segment. Um, and, then, uh, and then secondly, real quick is, uh, for the inventory managers in the room puts extra pressure on making sure you've got the right capital investment in inventory that's going to suit those trends. And I think, you know, these guys got to show us some of what those trends look like in, in uh, uh, the coming months. So hopefully, collectively, we can, we can react to those trends and make sure we stock the right things and, and spend our money in inventory the right way. So, you know, it used to be that typically the re wireless retail store employee in the mall was the highest paid employee. And, and um, I don't know if necessarily that's still the case, but certainly the margin crunch has definitely uh, had, had a negative impact on the earnings of everybody across the board, um, sales management, uh, sales employees, obviously. So 
So in talking to dealers, you know, we've run across different strategies, but um, what seems to be a more evident strategy is, is uh, some people are taking steps to um, reduce store staff. Um, that obviously puts you in a position to be hyper-vigilant on your staffing choices. Uh, we've got some partners here um, uh, as well that offer some, some trend analysis on store traffic data. You know, so, uh, and if you're within the AT&T world, certainly you've, you've probably heard of some initiatives to launch store traffic counting within your stores. And, and I think that's good. And if you do the analytics on that right, you're going to make uh, better staffing choices. Um, now, the carriers will tell you, the, the ones that I've talked to about store traffic say, you know, it's not necessarily about cutting store staff or, or reorganizing store staff. There's negative consequences, as you know, of doing that. You, you're not going to have um, that customer experience necessarily that you're going for. Um, but the carriers that I've talked to about it say, typically, the store traffic analysis is more about us trying to help the dealers figure out when to, you know, when in fact to staff more because you've got um, trends in your store that maybe you're understaffed for and missing opportunities. So.